Okay, I wanted to go over why I'm projecting over 8,000 PGY residency applications or applicants. Applicants, there's going to be uh, probably closer to 80,000 applications, but uh, 8,000 applicants and what you should do about it. So uh, let's get into it. Um, first, let's look at the PGY1 stats from 2019, uh, 7,105 enrolled. Uh, 1168 withdrew or did not return the message and what that comprises is 10% of that is I got a job and then a bunch of it is I didn't get an interview so as I go through this I'm gonna give you two numbers I'm gonna give you the percentage as of that that enrolled like at one point in time this person said they wanted to do a residency and then participating in the match but it doesn't really make sense to participate in the match if you didn't get an interview invite you could technically apply to a place where you didn't get an interview but obviously if you didn't get an interview they're sending the message that that might not work out for you so let's look at who matched so this is the magic number that you'll see going across that's 64 percent matched but I want to put an asterisk next to that because that number comes from the number that participated. So when they have the denominator, remember numerators on top, denominators on bottom, as 5937, they're saying we're going to take out those people who withdrew. And those people didn't necessarily withdrew, <laughs> withdraw because they wanted to. They just didn't get an interview. So now if we take it out of people that wanted an interview at or wanted a residency at any time that number is closer to 50 percent it's actually 54 percent taking that 3822 that matched over the 7105 that actually enrolled at the very beginning so I just want to be careful that you're not saying well you know it's like two out of three that I'm gonna get a residency when it's closer to one out of two and that number is actually probably lower for you or much higher for you depending on what school you go to uh, and what you've done over the last four years so there's a big misconception that when somebody looks at this and they look at it without regard to their history they say oh well it's one out of two and it really isn't there are a number of factors that go into that so how many didn't match so 2115 that had had at least one interview didn't get a residency and if you go from the enrolled number of students it was actually 3,283 now that gap in between is actually kind of a blessing that if you knew that you didn't get an interview then you had a little bit of extra time to make alternative plans when you were going to graduate and what kind of job you were going to get you knew you weren't going to get a residency because you were out of the match those 2115 however <clears throat> are sitting there right before spring break figuring out like all right well now what do i do i've got <clears throat> put everything i had into residency and now i didn't really have a plan b and there aren't positions really available at that time when you're sitting there like okay well it's March what do I do so my caveat mTOR I think that's what it is but buyer beware is always have a plan B okay always okay? And even some of the best applicants don't match because it is the match okay it's not a guarantee regardless of how good you are it may just be that it just wasn't a good fit okay so let's look at my projections I'm projecting that we're going to go up not 500 as we did last year but we're actually gonna go up a thousand and when you say that seems like a really big number with 140 pharmacy schools it's actually a little more than that and you multiply seven times that 700 plus seven times four makes 280 so you're talking about 980 and I just rounded to a thousand to make it easy but you're only talking about another seven students per school saying I'm gonna go for residency I increased the withdrew did not return uh, the same amount at 16 percent or something like that so I just said another hundred and then so we're gonna have 6700 participating okay so those are my projections for this year 
I personally actually think it's going to be a lot higher. I think that this increase is not going to happen gradually. I think it's going to happen exponentially. And I think this is the year. And I'll give you five reasons for that at the uh, end of these slides. So what does that mean for the actual match? Well, I'm saying that we're going to have 4,000 residency sites was an increase of around 200, 300 from last year, which is about what we see each year. We see about another two or 300 sites and it made for easy math. So <laughs> I just kind of went with that. So if we're going by the original uh, that we're going to say, okay, well, let's take the participating, not the people who withdrew, uh, then it would be 60% match rate. So three out of five or 4,000 out of 8,000, everybody who enrolled, you only have a one out of two chance. And you say, well, it only went down 4%. That's not really a, a huge big deal. But I think what's going to happen is that a lot of people are going to look at these numbers and say, well, I still, it's three out of five, or it's still one out of two. And they're going to look at it and have false confidence. And I'm going to tell you where I'm getting this extra thousand people or seven per school, but also why you may or may not be in a school designed to send people to residency. And you say, well, a pharmacy school is a pharmacy school. And what I'm finding is that what is generally pretty steady is the percentage of people that go from a certain school to residency. And what is it that they do differently that allows them to have such a high success rate? And I'll talk a little bit about that, um, but I'll probably do it in another video, which is, you know, figuring out your own odds of matching in a residency so you can have a much better picture of, well, how much do I really need to have a backup plan? Okay, so how many will not match so my projections are of the 8,000 that enroll fully half or 4,000 will not match fortunately 1,300 of them will know a little bit earlier than the other 2,700 but we're approaching almost 3,000 people who are not going to have a position that they were hoping for in March and may or may not have a backup plan and that's a ton so why do I project an exponential increase rather than a linear increase? Why didn't I just say, okay, well, 7,100 last time, 7,600 this time. Okay. If you look at the acceptance rates four years ago, it, was, it went up to 79.5%. Uh, right now it's 82.3. So there's some leveling off in the acceptance rates at pharmacy schools overall. And it looks like the, the pharmacy schools are going to continue to take around four out of five of the applicants, um, but they've just... I don't know what they're going to do next year, but that's that was a big leveling, and that number is actually wrong. It was 82.9 this year. Um, I think it was 82.3 last year or 82.5 last year, but right around 83%, so four out of five is what they're taking, and that was the second most PharmD acceptances in history. The thing is, is that it's tough for me to tell you what's going to happen over the next couple of years because as the number of schools entering the FarmCast went up, so did the actual number of people getting in leveled. So it was it's almost like 13,000, 13,000, 13,000, 13,000 for four years in a row. I'm not projecting any significant decrease in the number of acceptances, therefore the number of people applying to residency until 2024 uh, when we're going to have the first significant decrease in the class sizes of pharmacy schools or graduating class sizes where we're going to see, I'm going to say, 1,600 fewer uh, graduating that year because we're looking at around, this year I'm hearing that there's 25, about 25% 25 fewer applications, but that's not what you look at. What you look at is the 10 to 12% fewer um, applicants and with that many fewer applicants, then you'll see significant change in four years, but that doesn't do you much good right now. Okay, so next thing. We're seeing curricular residency put into, curricular residency preparation put into the actual curriculum. And 
if you go back to when I went to pharmacy school, they didn't even mess with residency until they knew that you were going to be a PharmD. So it was bachelor's, then two years PharmD. I was part of the first all PharmD class. And I don't think residency was such a thing back then. I mean, even four years ago, there were at least, I want to say four or 500 open residencies in 2015. In 2019, that number went to almost zero. I think it's like 99.2% of residencies match uh, with somebody that they want, and then there's a small number that don't. So these schools are just off the charts with what they're doing. And I'm not saying that other schools don't do this. I'm just saying that I'm familiar with the first four because of a presentation at AACP in Chicago. And I'm familiar with the flexibility of Iowa and Drake because I live in Iowa and I know those two schools. So Houston is off the charts with what they do. They've got student organization-led programming by faculty, by local residents, and they've got an elective course in the new curriculum for somebody that wants to do a residency. Like many big schools, they've got the Texas Medical Center, which has over 80 pharmacy residents. That is a huge number and a ton of preceptors and a ton of hospital beds over there. I think they have almost 10,000 uh, hospital beds or total patient hospital beds. Uh, so just a huge, huge number. They have what are called longitudinal events, so going over time that P1 to P4 students are going to. So when you see this as a P1 and a P2 and a P3, in October they do like a residency workshop, but then they have their own residency showcase in November, where traditionally we would see job fairs in October, and maybe they have one, maybe they don't, I don't know. But if you see a residency showcase in November, then you're saying, wow, you know, maybe this res there's something to this residency thing. And then you go to the uh, big one at ASHP in December if you decide to go. January, I know they have a social between uh, residency mentoring and then there's a post-match panel. What did you do right? What did you do wrong? And so this group at Houston is, there's this great book, uh, do twice the work in half the time that talks about scrum. But this is it. This is iteration after iteration hey what did you do right what did you do wrong and keep learning from your mistakes and probably one of the best programs in the country uh, doing this they also have a residency boot camp uh, it's a longitudinal course it's in the spring uh, before APPEs and I think it's led by their, their health system pharmacy admins or uh, masters residents and they're paired with a current resident as a mentor. And you can imagine that how having something like that over, I think it's over two months, and they, you know, you kind of figure out like what's the value of the residency? What do you need to do for the application? What do you do to interview? They get mock interviews. Uh, they do uh, figure out like what APPE rotations or what to do on those rotations and how to stand out and things like that. So they had a boot camp I know in 2018. And then they have a professional development track as P4s. So the proof is in the pudding there. Uh, residency match rate uh, is one of the best in the country. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Northeastern uh, also does something, and they just do it a little bit differently. But Northeastern also has a preparation where uh, they have a higher than uh, average match rate, and they have our live sessions. Um, you know, if residency is something somebody should want, uh, how do they prepare for mid-year and applications? How do they prepare for the interview? I know they have some uh, online modules. I think there's like seven, seven of the modules. I've talked to somebody about it. Uh, they had seven, like 15 minute online modules and then a live question and answer session. And then they have additional resources and then there's some student vlogs. And again, it's learning from the people that have gone ahead of you, and that's a very formal, uh, formalized process as it is with Houston. Kentucky, if I remember right, they focused on not just kind of the advice part of it, but really creating this advanced pharmacotherapy path where they're creating this kind of uh, way for you to 
get what you need in terms of projects, leadership, writing, uh, work experience, uh, rotations, letters of recommendation, uh, understanding where grades fit in, and they really do a great job of getting it into the curriculum. Uh, they have intern programs, uh, inpatient, specialty, and ambulatory, so someone is pretty much ready for residency as well. And so Purdue, I didn't see the the that part of the presentation, uh, but I know that they have one too. So you've got four schools that are creating this amazing kind of backstory for you and saying, hey, here are touch points where we're going to give you the advice that you need to know if you need to do a residency or not and so forth. Now I'm not familiar with the curricular residency preparation at Iowa and Drake but what I am very familiar with is the way that their APPEs are structured. Iowa did something kind of brilliant and I didn't realize it was how brilliant it was until someone did it perfectly uh, and I was fortunate enough to have that APPE student come through and what Iowa did was they added two elective APPEs in the P3 year. And at first I was like, okay, well, you know, you get a little more experience, that would be good. But what I didn't think about was if you talk about the three modifiable factors when you're talking about getting a residency, you have the letter of intent, you have recommendations, and you have um, that you did an APPE with someone. Well, by adding APPEs and by staying with a five-week model instead of a six-week model, you not only get the additional rotation because you're doing five weeks instead of six-week model, which means that you get one more person that can write a recommendation, one more place that you might get the clinical APPE ahead of mid-year. You also get these electives, and in these electives you get one more chance at a recommendation, one more chance at having the kind of residency that helps and I had a student come in and they did mine for that elective and what it did was if you'd look at the big five things that you need for to succeed as a residency applicant clinical research service teaching and leadership he had done leadership a ton started his own group uh, basically in un, in pharmacy school he had done a ton of service to the community and for his own school and then he took teaching with me because mine is basically a five-week teaching rotation you're teaching undergrad students so then he could focus just on clinical and research in those uh, six APPEs leading up to and through residency the other thing that these two schools do and they kind of share a, a similar map in terms of their APPEs is that there's flexibility in the curriculum when they need it so for no for December they have the flexibility in their APPE to go to mid-year in the spring when they need to interview for positions they also have that flexibility so at the time they need it most they have flexibility time off to spend the time they need so I know both of them work on the five week rather than the six week, which tends to be a, a newer thing. The newer schools tend to use the six week. So again, you are at a tremendous advantage getting even just one more APPE and one more possible recommendation because recommendations are basically one of the big thirds. Recommendations, LOI, and uh, if you did an APPE with that potential residency site, those are the big th three things that you can change. So if you're a P3 listening to this, I'm telling you, if you have any thoughts of a residency, make your APPEs around those spots. Okay, But in general, that there's more exposure to residency, I think is going to create increased interest in residency, at least application. Job fairs are becoming residency fairs, so if you look at your job fair that you just went to in October, if you're a final year pharmacy student, you might have noticed that there are a lot of residencies there. And you're like, well, I thought this was just for the retail jobs and the independents and the maybe managed care that we're hiring right out of school. But what we're seeing is a ton of residencies and fellowships now are coming into the job fair. And these job fairs are not as much a residency showcase, but residencies are coming in saying, hey, 
you know, we're actually in a position where we have to compete because now that there are so many residencies to get the best applicants, people have to hear about them and uh, it makes a lot more sense to pursue them locally because if you've got someone local that's going to be in your area then a residency fair makes sense but I think seeing so many residencies at the job fair also increases the chances that someone's going to think about or do a residency uh, fewer independent and retail positions I don't even need to go into this but uh, obviously there's been some quite a bit of bad news over the last year in terms of retail and independent uh, one of the big biggest uh, employers uh, the news is that they're possibly going to go private and this may or may not be a good thing I don't know yet it's just talk uh, right now as far as I know but uh, we're just seeing fewer independent and retail positions and so if you are having a few less positions many people that are, were kind of on the fence like well I might do a residency I might not are all of a sudden saying okay well I'm gonna apply for a residency it sounds like uh, that might be something required to get a position these days the last thing is, is that if you have more people getting rejected from residency application you're probably gonna have more people returning now the a number of people that return the next year or a following year to apply for residency that didn't get it is actually really small so this is a huge opportunity in terms of, I don't want to say opportunity, that's the wrong word. This is a huge area of possible growth where active pharmacists from last year that may have partial uh, hours or underemployed and those types of things are going to be now coming back saying, you know, 45000 in a job that has... Uh, full-time hours and that has health care and is helping me grow as a practitioner can improve my life work life and you know life and so forth then that becomes more attractive and then there are the other ones who are the pharmacists that are in practice now saying you know I I think it's time to move back before it becomes too late and I want to go back there because uh, there was an APHA uh, email that went out basically saying is PA the way to go you know becoming a physician's assistant and you you want to think of the spread here so if you're paying seventy five thousand for a program and not working versus making forty five thousand dollars and working you're talking about a hundred and twenty thousand dollar change from one decision to the other so if somebody spends seventy five thousand one year and another person makes forty five thousand another that's a hundred and twenty thousand dollar difference in their year so I think that these active pharmacists returning is also a possibility because uh, you know doing a PA unless you've already paid off your loans and things like that because I'm seeing gosh I've started looking I had someone send me their cost of attendance was a little over three hundred and five thousand dollars uh, for four years of pharmacy school not including undergrad so we're getting to the point where some students might be close to that half a million mark uh, in terms of their student loans and it's not uh, the majority it's 178,000 is the average but it is a possibility and I think that was the last one so let's kinda go back to the beginning uh, and what I'm projecting so I think that you're going to have 8,000 enrolled in in this residency season I think that your chances of getting one are going to be around 50-50 but watch for another video where I'm going to say what increases or decreases your odds of getting a or matching with a pharmacy residency.